All right, that was a pretty good Sunday school there. That's something that the um, Lord has really been teaching me over the last year and a half. Amen. Seeing some of the things that he was talking about this morning. And, uh, looking forward to it, brother. He, he asked me, uh, do a, does the meeting have a theme? I said, nope. Just come put what, say what the Lord's put on your heart. But I'll be honest. He talked to me about that when we were in Texas. And I was hoping he would cover that subject. I was hoping he would. But, but I'm not going to tell him what to. I'm not going to be one of these pastors to tell him what to say. I'm not going to do that. I'll let the Lord do that. I'm not that smart. Man, I'm not that smart. I don't know what he's supposed to say. If I did, I wouldn't have paid for him to come up here. I'd get up here and say it myself. <laughs> All right, brother, come on. Thank you, Pastor. All right. John chapter number 18. It's a good time with your pastor. I'd actually thought about all morning about doing a message called Truth. All, all morning I thought on it and and uh, toward the end of the morning, uh, the Lord moved me over to sp spiritual curiosity. At the end of that message, I didn't say it this morning, but at the, end of this mes at the end of that message, I actually have a part where I speak about you and what God has done in your life and the curiosity of God doing some things that some people may discount or say you shouldn't or it's too soon or whatever. And I, I just stand back and I look and I go, you know, I'm curious about all this. Uh, I, I must uh, say that I don't know all that God's doing. I bet you don't either. I'm just guessing, but I'm going to guess you don't either. That God's got ways that are far beyond anything you and I can even fit into our brains and comprehend. So stay curious about the work of the Lord and uh, what He's doing. Look at John 18. And once again, thank you for being in church and being such good listeners. If I go a little long, it's your fault. So, uh, just know that. Amen. All right. The message that I want to bring to you this morning is something that really has uh, enhanced my prayer life. And I hope it will be something that's helpful for you as well with my thinking and all of that. And ultimately, uh, a transformation. Uh, it'll make a transformation in the way we live if we live the way we believe. Do you live, do you live like you believe? That's a question I'd have you to maybe ask yourself this morning. Do you live like you believe? Look at John chapter number 18 with me and just make a, some comments and leading into it. Uh, I'll, not, I'll not suppose or to kind of presume how you think about God, okay? However, I would imagine that we all are somewhat restricted and limited in our practical beliefs, our practical beliefs about God, even though our conclusions would be better. That is to say, if I said to you this morning, uh, you believe God is all powerful, you would wholeheartedly agree with that. If I said to you that God is omnipresent or everywhere all at the same time, you would agree with that. If I said to you that God is all-knowing, you would affirm and you'd say, you're, you're absolutely right, Brother Scott. I completely and wholeheartedly believe that. If I said to you, uh, God is sovereign over all things that are taking place, you would, you would not deny that. You'd say that's exactly right. However, what we say we know about God and what we say we believe about God too often is very different when it comes to practicing what we believe. Or when it comes to living up to or in accordance with what we say we believe. Look with me please at John chapter number 18 and we'll look at a man. Look at uh, verse number 38 of chapter 18. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? When he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Apparently he found the truth. 
Notice verse number uh, four of chapter number 19, the end of it. Notice his conclusion again. I find no fault in him. Verse number six toward the end, once again, take him, crucify him, for I find no fault in him. I think he's onto something. I think he can find something he can use in his life. The question is this, can he live like that? The Jews answered him, verse 7, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. He, he, he should have been afraid. And he went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? Notice he's more anxious now. But Jesus gave him no answer. This is going to make him more anxious. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and a power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath a greater sin. And from thenceforth, notice this, Pilate sought to release him. Why? His heart isn't in this. The Jews must be reading his countenance and understanding this because they cried out saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, notice how all these things that he's hearing from the crowd are affecting him. They're, they're things that are influencing and impacting his decision making. He brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat. Now he's ready to judge because he's sitting this time on the judgment seat, a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Golbatha. And it was the preparation, of course. And notice what he says as he brings Jesus forth. Behold your king. And they cry out, away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. He finally gives in. And they took Jesus and led him away. Father, help us, I pray, as we look to your scriptures. Lord, uh, may we be curious about what you'll do. And Lord, with that, may we examine ourselves. Lord, to ask ourselves if we really live in accordance with what we believe. Or do we come up short? Help that thought to be on our mind, please, all of us, collectively, that we truly might live like we believe. We love you. Help us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Pilate said he found no fault in or with the Lord Jesus Christ. But when it came time to live like he believed Jesus was innocent, to actually prove it, to, to uh, prove that he uh, believes that Jesus is in innocent, he acted differently in his judgment from what his conscience told him about the Lord Jesus Christ. His belief... His conclusions or his actions didn't correspond with his belief. There's a conflict when it came time to act like he believed that Jesus was innocent, that he had, a, had made an honest evaluation of who Jesus was and he didn't find any fault. And as the judge and the person that's in charge here, he should have let Jesus go. And he knew that. In his heart, he knew that. He knew that was the right action for a judge to do with an innocent man. He knew that. He heard what the crowd said, but he knew also what he witnessed about the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what happened? Now, he, he, he said he had power to crucify or to release the Lord Jesus Christ, but he didn't. And truly, God's the one that has that power, and we know that. But the truth is this. 
It's his thinking that he's in charge here and that he has power of this. But even though he said that he had power, the truth is when it came time to demonstrating that he had power over himself, he didn't. He didn't act upon his belief. So, he didn't live honest with his own conclusion, honest with his own conscience and belief that Jesus was innocent. If he had, Jesus would have been let go. Look at John chapter number 6. Hold your place here. We'll come back again a little bit later. But look at John chapter number 6 with me. When push came to shove, uh, people will have their reasons and excuses as to why they don't live or practice their faith or the belief in God like they should. We know God can but we don't always live as though God will. And in fear and doubt, restrain, and usually a choke faith, we know that. We know that's true. And in a variety of ways and at critical times, we excuse ourselves more often than not about why we didn't live up to what we say we believe. And we're kind of like the guy that encountered Jesus with his son being possessed with the, the devil, and we say something like this, straightway the father of the child cried out, and said with, uh, with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. That, that's us. A lot of times that's how we are too. We believe, but help our unbelief. And so look with me, please, if you would. And let's ask ourselves the question as to whether we're living out our faith. Are we truly living by faith? Uh, when's the last time that you were encountered with an opportunity to live by faith and you didn't? Look at uh, verse number 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Uh, John six sixty seven. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away, seeing these other people go away, uh, knowing their conclusions? Will you go away also? Uh, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to say to you, I, I think as much as they could, they believed that. I, I, I believe uh, it sounds sincere. I don't want to question their sincerity. They, they sound sure about what they say. And, and as best that they could, I believe that they did believe. But their knowledge of him is certainly limited. And therefore, their belief of him or belief about him and the work that he's come to do, therefore, is going to be restrictive. And so as they sought to practice their faith, it's limited by what they're willing to believe. And as long as their faith isn't challenged, say we're all good about living Living by faith. Come on, now we're good at living by faith as long as our faith isn't challenged. As long as somebody's not putting you in jail for your faith. As long as it, I mean, please understand, I meditated on this some years ago, most of the things that you and I have in our life are planned out and they're budgeted. We know how much we can give to missions and we know how much we can give to the church. We know what our monthly income is. We, we kind of have all that stuff tidied up. And so the idea of truly living by faith, where is it? When is it? As long as our faith isn't challenged, we seem to be fine. Yet a challenge is going to reveal where your faith is and where it isn't. But, but did they believe, even though, did they truly believe? I mean, they said they did. Well, the Holy Spirit helps us. Look at chapter 7. Uh, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because of the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, they've been thinking about this thing, and they've got some words for Jesus. Depart hence and go into Judea, that the, thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. Thy disciples, you mean the ones who just left? 
Many therefore of his disciples, verse 60 of chapter number 6, when they heard these things, said this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And what did they do? They went away and they didn't come back. Verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more, no more with him. So, so let, let's just stop here and consider what they're thinking about. The, they're lonely. The crowds have gone away. It, it doesn't, now listen, it doesn't look like they're following anything anymore. It doesn't look like anything's happening anymore. Because the big crowds have all gone away. When the crowds are there, it looks like something's happening. I mean, we, we kind of always judge things by crowds. Come on. That, that's why, you know, the news media wants you to see a, a riot that's taking place in a particular city. And, and there's, there's hundreds of people that are out there riding. And they would have you to believe all of America's riding. Right. I mean, you know, you've been riding down the road thinking to yourself, well, now, okay, that's just really a small portion of the 300... 30 million people or whatever it is on the face of, 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 Ameri of American soil. But they would have you, the, the sight that they want you to see is everybody's doing it. Come on now. <clears throat> everybody's with it. And that's how Satan operates. That's how his lies work. His lies work in that particular fashion. So in their mind, they're thinking, look, the disciples have gone back. Nothing's happening now. Nothing's taking place. I like what one guy said and I often repeat it. Well, it's because, you know, people that are conservative, they've got jobs and they're working. They don't have time to riot. Come on now. They're trying to live their lives. Say amen. Come on now. But the idea is, is that when there's this thing taking place, you know, they're, they're thinking to themselves, nothing's happening now. And so the disciples are saying to him, look, we're lonely. Get back to doing some work. Kiss some babies. Heal some people. And the crowds will start coming back. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh, to be known openly. Well, once again, that's their conclusion. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And back in John chapter number 5, Jesus said, I get not my honor from men. So they weren't paying attention during that lesson. But verse number 5, why did they say all this? For neither did his brethren believe in him. Now that's Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit wrote that. Peter said that other thing back over there in chapter 6. The Holy Ghost said this. Which one are you going to believe? All right, you're going to believe the Holy Ghost. I know you will. Look at Matthew chapter number uh, 26. We doing all right so far? Matthew 26. Many of his disciples walked no more with him. Disciples going, man, what are you doing? You need, let's get this back. Why? Because they didn't believe Jesus, even though they said they did. So, so now as we take this relationship forward in time and, and arrive at an intersection, if you will, that kind of reveals what they really believe. When push comes to shove, even though they said one thing. And, and yes, they, seeming, they seemed willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They seemed devoted. They seemed genuine. They seemed sincere. They seemed committed and devoted to the cause of Christ. And I would suppose that they were in much of what they believed. In accordance with what he's doing. They did believe it somewhat. But it was what they wanted to believe. What happens when reality conflicts with what you want to be true? Well, I don't think it's any big deal for a person to da-da-da-da-da. Come on now. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with da-da-da-da-da. You know, fill in the blank. You can put in there whatever you want. It's usually how it starts. I don't think there's anything wrong with. I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't. I don't think that there's any... That's our conclusion, right? Come on now. That's what we want to believe. But when practicing faith, conflicts with reality. They failed. They fell short of their stated devotion and their pledged commitment to the Lord. Look at the verse number 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, this is scripture, guys, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But uh, notice the answer. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Peter, slow down. Wait a minute now. Did you hear him say the part about its scripture? Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night before the cock crowed, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Look, he's more vehement, he's more, he, he's more bold. Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also, 
said all the disciples. Practically, practically, they didn't execute their faith. Look at verse number 50 as Pilate shows, or excuse me, as Judas shows up. Peter pulls out the sword, right? Verse number 51. Then Jesus said, put the sword away. That's not the way we're going. Verse 53, thinkest thou uh, that I cannot now pray to my father and he will presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? Don't you think I can't take care of this? But how then shall, once again, the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be. This is scriptural, guys. What I told you before is scriptural. This is scriptural. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitude, are ye come out uh, as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I said daily with you teaching in the temple and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and did what? Fled. Practically, they did not execute their faith. Practically, they executed their flesh. They lived in accordance with what they wanted to be true. And we're not here to judge them. We're, we're here to grab a mirror quickly and put it up to ourselves and look at our own lives, examine our own lives, and see how we're practicing our faith in accordance with what we say that we believe about God, no matter what it is, no matter what comes. No matter how we come up short, practically when it comes to practicing our faith, we certainly have shortcomings. But we can talk a good game. We can talk a good game with the best of them. And perhaps we're sincere and we're well-meaning in what we do and, and, and what we say. And we want to do the right things. And we hope, if you will, that we are doing the right things. But we also hope that there's no challenge that ever comes to us that might reveal that our talk is just talk. I mean, we read the Bible, we hear it preached, we know it would uh, affirm with, with, things, with everything that we hear. I mean, the preacher's preaching and we read in our scriptures and, 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 and uh, yes, we would affirm and yes, we affirm and yes, we believe that's true and yes, but our actions don't always match up with our words. And when it comes to living purely biblical, there's a gap. Look at John chapter number 11 with me, please. Practically, we don't always execute our faith. We execute flesh. Another conversation along these lines that hopefully will help us just a little bit uh, is verse number 20 of chapter number 11, if you would please. Verse number 20 of chapter number 11. Then Martha, as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Uh, but Mary sat still in the house, then said, Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died, but I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Notice her answer. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I know that. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Well, did she answer his question? Now listen, once again, you find yourself in there, Martha? You find yourself in there being a Martha at times? Come on now. That's not what I asked you. How many of you ever had your parents say to you, that's not what I asked you? Come on now. You gave an answer, but it wasn't the answer that, to the question that was asked. Look at verse 37. Some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in, his, in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone laid upon it. Why is he groaning? Because they didn't believe. They didn't believe. They're traveling with him. He's taken them to a destination where he's going to show them a miracle. And on the way to that place, they didn't believe. That's why he's groaning. You ever groaned as a parent? 
<sighs> you ever groan being a boss at work, trying to get somebody to do something? <sighs> Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou shouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? You know why she said by this time he stinketh? Because she didn't believe. If you believe Jesus was about to raise your brother, go, oh, I can't wait to see this. It wouldn't matter if he stunk or not. Come on now. But when she said that, that he stinketh, by this time he stinketh, what is she saying? It's too late. Austin, what, she, what she's saying is it's too late. And that's why Jesus then follows up with the statement. He said, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. And of course, then he makes the statement, said Lazarus, come forth. I believe, she said. Well, if you believe, then you will see, he said. Then when the time came, by this time he stinketh is her answer. By this time it's too late. Look at Joshua chapter number 2. Joshua chapter number 2. Do you live like you believe? When you believe there's a certain way, a certain way that you live. We prove, we prove what we believe by how we live. No matter what. No matter what. Do you live like you believe? Now, different from Martha, we have Rahab the harlot. Look at verse number eight. And before they were laid down, before the spies are laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard that the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our heart did melt, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. But now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and to, to give me if you will, a true token. Notice the conversation there. Uh, notice the negotiation that's taking place. And that ye will save alive my father and his mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that we have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our life for yours if we utter not this our business and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Now there's a lot in all this and there's much that we didn't read that we could read that would add to all of this but for the sake of time uh, with this we just read these uh, six verses. I want you to notice that she put what she believed all on God. She didn't live like it was on her. She lived like it was all on God. She lived like she believed that God had granted dominion to these people to take over the, uh, over the land. She believed that. She believed it wholeheartedly. She had seen the evidence to support that fact. And so now, when push came to shove and representatives show up in her city from God, these two spies who came in discreetly to search out the land, at that moment she seized the opportunity of faith. She took advantage of an opportunity and she acted upon that as though she wholeheartedly believed it. There wasn't another time. There was that time, at that moment, to respond by faith and to do what God would have her to do. Why? 
She believed. And as a result, she lived like she believed. She seized her moment of faith. She protected the spies. She made a deal with them. And then she sent them away safely. Why? Because she believed. She lived like she believed. Do you live like you believe? And there's many stories throughout the Bible, if you will, where there's people who live like they believe. Noah went and built an ark over the course of a hundred years because he what? He believed. Moses left Egypt to identify with Christ because he believed. David faced the giant because he believed. They lived like they believed. Look at John chapter number 16 with me, please. John chapter number 16. Then we see Pilate. And perhaps as much as we would not like to admit it, maybe we're more like Pilate. You see, what complicated Pilate's thinking and what his conclusion was about the Lord Jesus Christ was what man was saying. And what man was saying made it very difficult for him to honestly and purely and completely listen to God and the conscience that God gave him. It complicated and it contradicted whenever he hears all this conversation. Pilate knew what he believed. He said it multiple times. He was honest in his word. I find no fault in him. He said it to them. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him at all. I, I don't find any fault. He's not guilty. I don't... No, look guys, he's not guilty. He's not... At, no, I don't find any fault in him. He says it over and over again. Why? Because he believed it. And yet, he heard what they said. Even his wife came to him and said it had nothing to do with this, this man. And he knew that it was in his heart of hearts that Jesus was innocent. He understood that. He, he, he realized that. But he heard the crowd. He heard what they said. He listened to man's opinions. The brethren speaking. And it corrupted his decision to do right. Look at verse number 29, please. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now thou speakest plainly and speakest no more proverb. Now are we sure? Well, they've used that word before. In John chapter 6, they used the same word. Which time did they mean it? Come on now. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Sounds bold. Sounds decisive. Sounds like they've got a decision here that they can live by and they're committed to. And Jesus answered them, do you now believe? All along the way, he's working to strengthen and to grow their faith that Christ consistently was doing and saying things as he's trying to, to broaden and, 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 and strengthen and encourage because he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming their way. He knows about the conflicts that they're going to face. He knows about the circumstances that are going to be rough and they're going to be difficult and they're going to be unsettling and, and there's going to, there's going to be a challenge that's going to come to their very core. Just as it was there in Matthew chapter number 26, that their faith, their faith is, is going to prove weak and insufficient time and time and time again. And it doesn't matter what it was. Man knows how to reason away and to excuse his lack of faith. So it is true with them, so it is true with us. We do the same thing. And when Jesus died, they didn't believe. And that's why when he came back afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at me and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. 
came back with testimonials and said, we, we saw him, he's alive. You won't believe it. You don't believe it? Don't believe it. Unless I can put my finger in the side and, come on now. I will not believe it, Thomas said. Unfortunately, too often we're more like him. Will we live like we believe? And we must understand that God has been using this time in our life that we're facing right now. I believe, I am convinced of it, that God has allowed these things in the last days that we've been, we've been seeing to condition us for the end. Because as we're living and going along in our normal life, right? We're going along in normal life. We've not been living with an end time mentality. Which we desperately need. Because there may be some things that confront you. There may be some police officers that come in that back door. And say, now listen folks, you're meeting illegally. Will you be here for that Sunday morning? The church in California that... He and I know, I preached in it last week. Illegally preached in it, I guess. I illegally preached in California last week. Police officers came in the back door. This is months ago. The pastor's standing in the pulpit and these men come in and say, you're meeting illegally. What are you going to do? He went to court. Stood before the judge. There was over forty thousand dollars worth of fines against him. He walked into the judge. As he walked up to the judge, standing before the judge, the judge says, "How do you plead?" That's what they always say. "How do you plead?" He said, "I don't have a plea." He said, "What do you mean you don't have a plea?" He said, "I didn't do anything wrong." The judge didn't quite know what to make of that. He said, "Well, okay, then explain to me." Explain to me why you did what you did. The judge wanted to hear it. He was curious. It's a good thing he got curious. He said, well, he said, unless we assemble, he said, we're not meeting with God. We're not having church. He said, the Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. He said, sir, we have to assemble or there is no church. He said, look, sir, you've got people going down here to the grocery store that are assembling down at the grocery store, and you're letting them do that, and they don't, have the second com they don't have the second or the First Amendment right to assemble like I do as a believer. He said, you have to do what you have to do, but he says, I have to do what I have to do. The judge went away scratching his head. Weeks later, weeks later, they dropped the charges. You know why? Because there's a pastor who stood in a church and who said, I'm going to live like I believe. Now listen, you're going to be faced with some of this maybe. Get your smiley face on. Come on now. All that, shall live God, all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. And please understand, there's a difference in wrath and persecution. I don't have time for that. There's a difference. All that will live, come on now, in Christ Jesus shall what? Now, I don't say that to scare you. I say it this morning is, is because we've got to come into this end time mentality. We're late. We're We're late. It, it, it understanding and, and being conditioned. And I, and I believe it's the grace of God that allowed for COVID-19 to come into our life to condition us for the end time. The Lord said they're not ready. They're not ready. And we could say that Jesus going to the cross was a conditioning for them to get them ready. Because when Jesus left, they're it. When Jesus left, they're the ones that are going to have to go out there and tell the world about Him. And if they don't do it, you telling me all that three and a half years is going down the drain, down the tubes? 
Well, let me ask you a question. Is all the training and all the effort and all the instruction and everything God put in us, does it go down the tubes? Or does it make us ready for a time just before He comes? Summary of thoughts. You can write these down if you like. First of all, faith is calling. Faith is calling the just must live by. Faith is a calling the just must live by. One more time, faith is a calling that the just must live by. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 1, verse number 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's repeated it throughout the Bible. Habakkuk 2, 4 was the first one I read. Then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, But that no man... Uh, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. If you're not living by faith, then you're not living justly. Look at 1 Kings chapter 17. You're not living just if you're not living by faith. The just shall live by faith. Second thing I want you to see, your faith must take you beyond your limits. Your faith must take you beyond your limits. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. One step into that area where the waters are parted was beyond them. Now they're in the, in the place, if you will. Until that, they're on dry ground and everything is all right. But one step forward, now they're in that territory. They're in that area. They're in that region where it's God. There's a certain area that's beyond us. That when we take that step, we're in an area now that belongs to God. It's all His. He decides whether we live or whether we die. He decides whether we're going to be all right or we're not going to be all right. 1 Samuel 14, verse number 6, Jonathan understood, understood that when he said, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint of the Lord to save by many or by few. He said, this is going to be beyond us, Mr. Armor Bearer. The Lord's going to have to take this over. It's beyond us. 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verse number 46 and 47. Uh, David makes the statements in that passage. The scripture won't take time for all, but he says, uh, he, he says, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with uh, sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Notice, if you will, it was beyond David, and David knew that. The battle is the Lord's, he said. And that, that, that was beyond him. That, that was big talk. Other people might have looked at it and said, that's just big talk, David. No, David believed it. And God stood with David in that battle. God made sure that Goliath fell down forward on his face and died. God did that. Daniel 3, 16 and 18, about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they answered the king, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. Be it, uh, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Either way, we know this is beyond us. Peter, as he steps out of the boat, he asks the Lord, if it be thou, bid me come, the Lord said, come. When Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's not humanly possible. Humanly speaking, it was beyond him. But guess what? He got out of the ship and he started walking on the high seas. Most people's faith is not so challenged. Most people live a life where their faith is not demonstrated. Name the times in your life when your faith took you beyond your limits. The next thing I want you to see is you must be in a position on purpose of loss, risk, and failure in order for your faith to be proven true. And that's the woman here. Notice verse number nine. 
Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And he arose, and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and called to her, and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her, and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As, thy, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Notice her plan for the rest of her life. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The meal barrel, or the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. The barrel had to be empty after she gave. Can you, do you give like there will be abundant life after the empty meal barrel? Or do you live like that's it? See, she was living like that's it. This is it. I'm going, to do, I'm going to eat this and I'm going to be dead and it's going to be gone. Then she was asked to do something that's beyond her. She's asked to do something that puts her in a position of risk and loss and failure. Oh, I made the wrong decision. Boy, I gave to him and now look, it's been days and two weeks have gone by and there's no meal in this barrel. Risk. Failure. A danger to her. Faith. Faith. Do you give like there will be abundant life after the meal barrel is empty? You ever emptied your bank account on purpose? Daniel chapter number 6, the Bible speaks about Daniel had the knowledge of the decree against praying. Do you, can you live like the lion's den will be full of lions after you pray? You show up to church knowing that the federales, the magistrate's going to be here to take you to jail? Or do you get a text from somebody and say, don't come, they're here. Don't come, they're here. Or do you drive on to church? Daniel chapter 3, uh, the three Hebrews refused to bow down as they faced the fire of consequence. Can you, do you live like the fire will be stoked to meet you. Next statement. What you have believed must begin and end with God. The common evidence in all of these scenarios, in all of these stories is God. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You live that way? One of the greatest, most powerful, and yet untapped resources in the church today is faith. It's unrealized, it's unrecognized, it's, it's undiscovered, it's unsought. It's abundant, it's available, but it's untapped. Faith. The faith of the believers. Faith leads to power, God's power. You, you said it last night as we were talking about, if every Christian lived as we talked about uh, last night, what a difference it would make all across our country. Well, same thing too, true with regards to faith. If every Christian across America demonstrated such faith, do you understand what power would be unleashed on this nation? Just believers. If every Christian across America lived by faith, you, you, I'm telling you, you talk about power being unleashed, I believe God would be standing up and just... Just as they were for Stephen, as Stephen demonstrated such great faith in God's ability. 
He liked it so much when the three Hebrews did it, he got in the fire with them. He goes, scoot over, guys. I went in there with you. You guys look like you're having fun. Amen. Do we live like we believe? Or not? Look at Romans chapter 4. One last passage of Scripture. Won't take long with it. You would affirm, you'd say, God is all-powerful. God's omnipresent. God's all-knowing. He's sovereign in that world and also in this world. He's in complete control of the seen and the unseen. You, you would affirm all of that. You would agree with every bit of that. However, maybe like Pilate, when it comes to living out what we say we believe, there's conversations about you know, being safe and being discreet and, and harm-free and carefree. Our, our faith is rarely, rarely ever put to the test. At, at, at a moment of executing our faith, we're more likely to kind of draw back instead of go forward. Now, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. So have we begun to please God? And how have we begun to please God? The just shall live by faith. Romans chapter number four, it won't take time for all this, but there's a promise that came to him, uh, came to Abraham, and he decides that he's going to live by faith, and he goes out, he leaves where he's at. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be of grace, verse number 16. As it is written, I have made thee a father unto many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Wonderful. And being not weak in faith, considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. He believed it. Faith will engage you and involve you with God. It will alter and it will change your course. It'll take you places that you've never ever been before. It'll put you in circumstances that you don't want to be in. Faith will challenge your comfort. It will disrupt your peace. It will take you on a journey of selflessness. It'll put you in a valley of despair. Faith will take you to a mountaintop of the hardest decision that you've ever had to make in your life. And then it will reward you with the greatest gifts. See, Abraham's life was all orchestrated by the Lord of hosts. It set him out on this journey that he was on. And time and time again, he said yes to God. Just what God's asking you and I to do. The just shall live by faith. He wants us to say yes, and yes, and God, yes, and yes. And when it came down to it, he didn't live by a fantasy, he lived by faith. He took his son to the top of the mountain and he killed him. In his heart. He killed his own son in here. When he raised that knife, it was done. The Lord stopped him. Why? Because it had already been done. God didn't need it physically because the act of faith had already been committed here. I don't know about you, but I want to pray in such a way and live in such a way as though I believe. If your head's bowed and eyes closed, stand with me for a moment. Let me pray with you, and then we'll have a moment of invitation. God, help me. Help me to think and act like I know. Lord, help me to be convinced like I truly believe. You're a God in everything that I do. Help me not to forget that all things that you've done to bring me to where I am today. Help me to live like that. That you're God in all things. You're God of all things. And that perhaps today, Lord, you will favor me as I seek to serve you. I know you can, but perhaps, Lord, you'll favor me in a way today, in your name, for your glory. Lord, help me to wholeheartedly believe in you. Help me to live knowing that you are God when I do not see your favor. 
Help me to live victorious even as I stand in the midst of loss and risk and failure. I want I don't be changed in my prayer life to live in accordance with what I truly believe. Lord, help me to live like that every day. Lord, because time and time again, I find that my greatest failures are because I didn't live in accordance with what I actually said that I believe. That I live more like I was living a fairy tale than when reality hit, Lord, I, I failed because I didn't live up to what I said I believe. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as challenges come before us, that you would increase our faith to be prepared and ready for that. Help us to know that when we invest our faith into your work, that you'll increase our faith. And that that's where the value is. And when we become more valuable to us, that you can use us and we'll be more useful to you because we're more faithful, because we're more full of faith. To become more and more a demonstration of your power at all times. And Lord, as we look at these stories in the Bible that we can see, they're an exhibition of the power that was given to people who believed. They lived like they believed. And a demonstration to a lost and dying world. And Lord, I want that to be me. And I pray that all of us would want the same thing. Help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, you pray uh, for us softly, sister, brother. If you want to sing along with it, that'd be great. And just move if God's asked you to move in your heart, whether you physically come to the altar or not, that you will move there.